you know, the reality is we are reacting to a situation. I remember I lived up by the pipeline when they were building the, uh, the big pipeline, the Millennium Pipeline, and I'm why are they building this pipeline? They were keeping it very quiet because they knew that once we found out what they were going to do and what that pipeline was being built for, uh, that there was going to be a lot of trouble. So when they were building the Millennium Pipeline, they didn't even talk about what it was really going to be used for, that there was going to be all this fracking going on because they didn't want to let the cat out of the, the bag that soon because then there would have been protests against the Millennium Pipeline being built. But um, the, the reality is, if we, you know, this country, we're, we're reacting to a situation now, and that's great, and the people in this room are responsible for the great things that New York State has uh, done, done so far to prevent this technology from ruining our, our waters. Um, and, uh, and all the other things that it brings with it. It's not just waters, it's the roads, it's the air pollution, and it's also the social impacts. You go down to Bradford County right now and look at the police blotter and see um, how many arrests are made, how many emergency room visits there are, how, many, how much drug abuse there is, how the rents have gone up, skyrocketed, and the people who can't afford to buy a house are now uh, can't find a place to rent anymore and, and, and can't live even in their hometown. Um, so there's a, a lot of other consequences to this technology as well in this, in this kind of uh, uh, drilling. So as we go forward, we have to not only fight this front, but we have to start demanding that this nation has, and as Sandra talked, alluded to it, uh, uh, an energy policy that makes sense. And if we don't, we're going to continue to have to fight these battles. Uh, if, when, when Jimmy Carter, who's a much maligned president by many, when Jimmy Carter was the only president that finally put some kind of energy policy together, and uh, if, if they had put, if the CAFE standards for automobile uh, mileage had, were in effect today, the ones that were going to progress, we wouldn't be sitting here because we would be using so much less energy in this country that there wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't be a clamor to find the supposedly, um, you know, ways to get the bridge to the future. We wouldn't need them. We, we would, uh, and when, Stock, when Reagan got in in 1981, uh, Stockton completely got rid of the CAFE standards. They, they killed them. And so now here we are again. So we can't keep reacting. We have to have fight this fight, but we also have to start demanding that our nation has a sound uh, energy policy, which includes uh, renewables, because that is the future. Uh, photons hit the, the earth all day long, and, and it's, they're, they're, they're actually becoming less and less expensive to, to, uh, take a, uh, to produce into usable energy and everything else is going the other direction, get higher and higher prices to extract energy. And obviously the, the pollution part of it as well. But thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for all the energy you put into this fight. Uh, but let's, let's broaden it. We need to broaden the scope and make sure that we are constantly uh, on our legislators to do the right thing by this country as far as a, a sound uh, energy policy that, goes, that will really take us to the future. As a director of the occupation medicine at UHS, I'm exposed to a lot, and preventive medicine, I'm exposed to a lot of medical issues uh, related to uh, environmental diseases and so forth. Of course, the issue of hydrofracking now is on the surface. It's a very emotional issue. It's uh, uh, kind of dividing us. Um, and causing a lot of problems, basically because there are a lot of misunderstanding or no understanding of the health effects of uh, hydrofracking. And that's why we're here today. However, I'd like to clarify a couple of things. First, the Broome County Medical Society, as well as the New York State Medical Society, does not have an official stand for or against hydrofracking. However, the Tompkins County Medical Society, as well as Broome County Medical Society, did have resolutions support their moratorium on hydrofracking until we understand the effect of hydrofracking. 
As you already heard, of course, there are other technologies which we are not used here, the gas fracking or the propane fracking. That probably should be explore, explored before we employ the uh, uh, slick water uh, hydrofracking that has been used now in Pennsylvania and being proposed to use in New York State. Our first presenter is Dr. Ron Bishop. Dr. Bishop holds a BA in chemistry from Youngstown State University and PhD in biochemistry from the West Virginia University School of Medicine. In his 17 years of full-time research, his projects were related to cancer and biosafety. For the last 11 years, Dr. Bishop has taught a variety of courses, biology, genetics, general and organic chemistry, biochemistry, and so forth, as well as environmental sciences. In high school and colleges as well, he currently teaches in the chemistry and biochemistry department at SUNY Onienta and is nationally certified as chemical hazard management. Please welcome Dr. Ron Bishop. Hi, can you all hear me all right? Um, as I mentioned to you uh, a little bit about who I am and where I'm from, I want to just bring up a couple of points about why I'm standing here before you, how I first got to study this industry. Um, I lived for eight years in Morgantown, or in and around Morgantown, West Virginia, in the heart of a fossil fuel extraction area. And that experience was um, a real awakening to me. I mean, I, I grew up in Steel Valley, not far from Youngstown, Ohio, but uh, where coal and oil and natural gas extraction are going on all around you is a very different culture because when you have those kinds of industries going at a pretty intense level, there's a very complicated relationship people have with these industries. Of course, they are what they are. They're industrializing the landscape. and but everybody has someone in the family who makes a living in that industry if they've been you know there for a good long time and everybody knows somebody who's been injured by that industry there's always this complex relationship so when people asked me to to take on an assessment of the, the industry's technology because of course I you know I, I'm a tech technical kind of person, not just as an academic in chemistry and biology, but also with a pretty robust background in construction. So I've worked with lots of concrete and steel for many years, you know, in a very, you know, high-level professional way. This helped me with the learning curve and also helped me, I think, to, you know, kind of approach questions from that, that point of view of, you know, experience on construction sites. So what I'm going to do essentially with my part of this is try to present a nuts and bolts idea of what's really expected from the industry. I keep up with the industry as best I can on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got lots of contacts you know, within the industry, within Halliburton's um, research and development um, units, uh, Schlumberger, um, and as well as outside the industry with a wide variety of environmentalists who have a wide variety of concerns. And so I'm going to come. To, I'm going to probably present some information that you've already heard before. Some of what I have to say might differ from some of what you've heard. I try not to be terribly alarmist unless something actually alarms me, and we'll talk a little about that as time goes by. So let's get into it. We're having this discussion here, as uh, Sandra Steingraber alluded to, and I would like to thank her, by the way, for making my talk look, talk look distinctly inarticulate. <laughs> <laughs> We're having this discussion because oils and oil and gas deposits started in the shale formations, which were sediment deposits in the deepest parts of the deepest seas that were around. The inland sea that's under our feet wasn't quite like an ocean, but it was deep enough to form a lot of these um, carbon deposits. And, and so it's in the very deepest abysses of these, you know, that we get the black shales formed and got them formed in those geological periods. At least two periods produce shales that are accessible to us. One that you all know, I've heard of, I'm sure, is called the Marcellus you know, Shale, named after the small town of Marcellus, New York, just southwest of Syracuse. 
below that one, extending somewhat to the southeast and north from it, is another shale deposit called the Utica Shale, named after guess what? <laughs> Utica. <laughs> There's one in every crowd. Okay. Um, there are deeper hydrocarbon bearing shales even below that. For example, has anyone ever heard of the Trenton Black River Formation? That was a conventional deposit, a pooled resource of, uh, of, of um, mostly uh, natural gas. And the capping structure for that was the Utica Shale. It had broken free from that to, for, you know, uh, for free to form that conventional deposit from a shale even deeper than the Utica. Let me um, try to illustrate. This is the extent that, min, uh, and many of you are aware of this, how far across the southern tier of New York these shales go and how far you know, south and west from here. I won't spend time on that. Um, virtually all oil and gas deposits f start in these shale formations that were you know, um, responsible for, first of all, trapping the, or the organisms, the critters that, that died there, and then by chemical and biological processes converting them to oil and natural gas over time. And so the, the shale itself is the uh, um, originator for these deposits, is also the, deposit, the repository or the reservoir for most of them. Some of these deposits broke free into things like transitional zones. Um, one of these transitional zones is in the Gulf of Mexico where they were trying to develop the Macondo well uh, that we now know as the BP, you know, um, incident. Um, many of these deposits, um, mostly to the west and south of here, um, have a combination of oil, as well as, which is in green, along with natural gas, which is in tan, along with the brines that are down there. Many of them, as we understand it, you know, originally parts of those deep seas. Virtually all oil is developable with some natural gas along with it. And also virtually all gas comes with at least some oil. So when we see this spectrum on the side over here, the mock-up of you know, just natural gas having broken free from the shale layer and gets capped or, you know, or kind of pools under some kind of a capping structure, that you know, conventionally positive of natural gas is not actually completely free of all wet hydrocarbons. It's a spectrum sort of thing. The, the dry gas is drier than the wet gas, but there's oil in almost all natural gas. There's natural gas in virtually all oil deposits, and they all started from a shale from somewhere. Now, these conventional deposits, as Sandra had mentioned earlier, we've burned through most all of them. There are a few left in some of the sandstones, you know, um, and many of the capping rock structures that form these domes are shales. Um, the, um, and so the, the Marcellus and the Utica, if you will, form something of a sandwich structure with a variety of sandstones and limestones and dolomites interleaved between them. And some of those sandstones, um, some of them actually not very porous sandstones called tight sands, are also you know, reservoirs of more or less conventional gas deposits. They, they might need to be lightly fractured to give up the gas, but that's how it kind of goes. So everybody's with me here on where all this stuff is coming from. The problem with the shale is even though most of the oil and gas are there, it's the last place on Earth you want to go to get it from. And that's because the, the tiny pockets, almost actually microscopic, um, pockets of gas that cling t tightly to this petrified rock are, are not connected by fissures very well. And if they were at once connected by fissures because a high organic content make, tends to make you know, uh, shale rocks a little bit more brittle and, and, and more fracturable than low organic deposits, um, because of all the pressure that's on top of them from all the rocks on, you know, that are between them and the surface, um, the fissures that are there tend to get, you know, squeezed shut. And so what we have is we've got a shale layer down here that just isn't going to give up the gas very easily. So in addition to drilling down to it, you also have to fracture it to give the gas pathway to flow back. Now, uh, this is a slide I think many in the room have seen. Uh, it's typical in a vertical well operation to drill vertically down to the shale, blow holes in the end of the pipe, 
um, so that you can then force fluids at high pressure to force cracks in the rock. And along with forcing fluids into that, you've got to put in some propant. As I mentioned, all the weight of the overburden that they call it on these deep layers can push these cracks back shut if you don't prop them open. And so that's what the purpose of the sand or you know the angularized sand or the ceramic beads or whatever they're using. That's, that's its purpose, is to actually hold the cracks open. And then from there we come up with a need for other additives that are some of them related to the sand and some related to other conditions. In just a moment I'll talk about that. Now it's not very efficient in terms of the shale gas development to do a vertical well. The fact that you have to go and hydraulically fracture and throw in you know, propens and a, a variety of other additives really raises the cost and the effort of doing these kinds of projects. And so if you're going to hopefully make cracks of two to five hundred feet in a radius around this well bore, all the gas you're going to get is from basically a cylinder in this shale that's no more than about a thousand feet across. That's simply not very efficient for all the effort it took to get to that point. So to increase the efficiency to where it makes a marketable gas where they can actually make money on it, they really want to drill down to the shale and drill horizontally through the shale. And the point of this then is that longer surface contact with the shale, you can you know, get a lot more gas out of a single well and that makes it economically viable. At $2 per thousand square feet, you can make money on a conventional shale well, according to my friend Lou Alstadt, who was a vice president from Mobile Oil Corporation for many years. For a shale gas operation, your break-even point is between five and six dollars a thousand square feet, which is why at the moment a number of vertical wells even being developed in New York right now are being drilled hydraulically fractured and then shut in with blowout preventers. No pipelines run over to them until gas prices improve and it makes it worth actually selling that gas. They're drilling to hold the leases but they're not, it's not lucrative right now to sell the gas until the prices go back up. We're seeing a lot of that across New York you know, right now, just as an aside. Now the biggest difference between the vertical operations and the horizontal operations is a matter of scale. Uh, to develop a, a vertical operation, you're going to need to uh, use about 80 to 120,000 gallons of water and some other additives at rates that run actually from an analyzing flowback fluids of uh, between 0.5 and 0.8 percent of the total volume. To do a horizontal well, of course, depending on how long you're going under, you know, underneath, and uh, the average runs about a mile. They're capable of going out to over uh, to almost two miles, up to about 9,000 feet. I think is is close to the longest practical limit for their uh, horizontal laterals. You'll use anywhere between three and eight or nine million gallons of water. So we're talking about a scale, an issue of scale that is 50-fold more fluids to develop a horizontal well than you would need to deal with a vertical well. There's also about twice as much pipe, about three times as much concrete, okay? And the rigging is a little bit more complicated for a horizontal well as well, so you'll have more trucks delivering rigging and things like that. So we are talking about a really vast issue of scale that makes the horizontal large volume projects very much different than the vertical projects we've seen in the state up till now. Um, now, just a word about the propane fracturing. There are some good reasons it's no, not planned for use right away. One, of course, is the low cost of gas. Propane's more expensive to use. You need a larger well pad because the setback for the propane handling facilities is further from the well because of the um, flammability and you know, explosion issues. Um, Propane does not actually require the use of water, but it does require the use of additives because just like you need to thicken the fluids in a hydraulic fracturing procedure to carry the sand, you have to thicken propane too. Liquid propane is a very thin fluid like, you know, like water. And for what it's worth, you know, the favorite thickening agent for propane right now is an alum complex of tributyl phosphate 
which, for what it's worth, is borrowed from the military. They use it as a nerve gas simulant. So it's not without its issues. Now, everywhere you're going to drill a well in the east, you're pretty much going to have to pass through somebody's drinking water aquifer. And so the, the real key to keeping this, or trying to keep this clean, is to do a good casing. Um, and I borrowed this slide from our former DEC commissioner, Pete Granis, and it shows the, the design of a, a well. At the very top here, you see um, what's called the uh, conductor casing, or the shoe. And this is a casing that will run anywhere from about nine feet you know, deep to as much as 100 feet deep, depending on how much surface unconsolidated gravel and, and muck you have that you don't want falling down <clears throat> into the in, internal area that you're going to be doing your deeper drilling into. Inside that um, conductor casing is what's called a surface casing. Every well has one of these. And the point of the surface casing is to seal the well off from any potential usable drinking water that's underground. And by New York State code, the surface casing has to go a minimum of 75 feet into bedrock below the deepest usable water well in the area. And the DEC has pretty good records on how deep people's water wells are, and so they're able to track that. And in, in a typical installation, the surface casing is um, cemented to the conductor casing by a layer of concrete, an inch and a half to two inches thick, typically. And in New York, they use centralizers to make sure that that you know uh, uh, steel casing doesn't bow and have thin spots in the concrete. The intermediate casing I'm not going to talk about because it's very rarely installed. I thought that there was only one or so installed across uh, the state um, in the last couple of years. I've since learned that there are about two more. That's not a lot. Many of you may or may not know, we currently have about 13,000 active oil and gas wells already going in New York State. Of those, about 6,800 of them are gas wells and the rest are oil. Um, and so two or three installations of intermediate casing to me is not, um, and you wouldn't expect it to be in a local well without some really good reasons for that. And then there's the production casing. This thing goes full length, and in the case of a horizontal well, it goes all the way out to the end, and it's concreted full length. So there's no open bore drilling in New York State, and there's um, um, no, at least not in the last three years, no wells that haven't been cemented all the way to the bottom. Um, now, New York State, at least lately, has also been requiring drillers to do a cement bond log before they can do any hydraulic fracturing to show that there aren't any spaces between the, uh, um, the, the steel casing and the concrete. These cement bond logs are typically pretty good. The, the detection limit for cement bond log, unfortunately, is a little worse than the size fissure it takes for natural gas to escape because you only need a, a crack of about a thousandth of an inch for gas to go where it's not supposed to go. But a cement bond log would at least you know, give you the quality of information that you have a well that would contain liquids, if not all the gases. So it's possible to see things like methane or hydrogen sulfate, sulfide or radon migration without any liquids following. And in fact, it's much more common to have the gases go where they're not supposed to go than to have liquids get out of order. A typical um, emerging technology that's getting a lot of uh, play, especially in industrial you know, spokespeople's presentations, is the idea of a multi-well pad to try to reduce the impact. If you use a multi-well pad and long laterals, you can actually um, recover virtually all of the gas from a one square mile or a 640-acre area with one multi-well pad. Uh, they're actually experimenting in um, parts of Arkansas and Pennsylvania with larger multi-well pad projects with a, up to 16 or 18 laterals that can in fact cover two square miles or 1,280 acres. And the idea is the same, to try to focus most of the construction activity to a smaller area, one access road in, one pipeline out, and a whole bunch of wells draining a huge area. This is all really, really good thinking, by the way, unless you happen to live directly next to the operations of this well pad. Because if that happens, you will probably you know, see much more 
up close and personal contact with the intensive phase of construction. But uh, so this is uh, something that they, you know, early on we're, we're calling this octopus strategy, and and it's one of the things that um, pro environmentalists, you know, who don't live next to a, a leased area, promote as a good way to scale down the footprint and the impact of some of these wells. A little bit more about that later. Now into chemistry, because hey, what, that's kind of where I'm supposed to come from, isn't it? Of course, these black shales contain organic carbon, gas and or oil. If they didn't have that, this would be a really boring forum, I suppose. We also have some toxic metals, and they vary from place to place, and they also vary from shale formation to shale formation. Um, and this is you know, how that's always going to go. Um, most of the Marcellus that has been adequately tested until now, for example, is known not to have very high levels of mercury, which are more typical of the Haynesville shales in Arkansas or the Barnett Shale of Texas. However, we have higher levels of lead and arsenic. Okay, so you can choose your poison depending on where you live. Um, but these toxic metals are, are in the shale and, and they can be brought up in soluble forms by the hydraulic fracturing technology because the slick water is actually does have some soap kind of characteristics to it and it can promote leaching from the rock of things that otherwise wouldn't readily come out. We also get pretty distinctly high levels of brine. Now the in, in New York State since these shale formations tend to have outcroppings to the north and they slant downward through the earth as you go south even by the time you get like to the state line not far south from here, we haven't reached any incredibly deep geologic formations to get to these shales. And, and therefore, the brines that we are, are likely to encounter in New York State don't go to the high end of the salinity scale. And the salinity scale for all shales um, runs from about on par with sea level salinity to about five times more. Well, we won't get to that upper limit in New York. We'll get to, in the terms of exploiting the Utica Shale, about seven or 8,000 feet beneath the surface where we are about here, you'd get to a salinity of about twice the salinity of seawater. That's still a lot of salt, and it's something that really has to be dealt with. Um, those deep brines also, for whatever reason, tend to harbor higher levels of bromide rather than chloride. Um, this is something that I don't think that was fully appreciated until we started having bromide spikes in some of the creeks and rivers across Pennsylvania. And it's one of the special characteristics. It's also one of the chemical fingerprints that we can use even without using tracers is um, the actual chloride to bromide ratio, which is characteristic of these shale areas. Um, some of this is actually being developed by um, workers, for example, like Don Siegel from uh, Syracuse University. Um, I'm going to bring up the radioactive elements, but not necessarily in the way you would expect me to. Some shale is hot and some shale is not. And frankly, a lot of it's cold. All the Marcellus samples I've been able to get from outcroppings near Cherry Valley, not far from where I live, I'm just on the southern tip of uh, Lake Otsego, just southeast of Cooperstown. All the Marcella shale I have been able to physically get my own hands on and test with my department's Geiger counter, because after all I'm the safety officer, have been cold. Not to be funny about it, but cold as a stone. Not all the Marcella shale is free of radioactivity, but also not all of it's radioactive. So if I had to spend my nights staying up and worrying about something, I wouldn't worry about the radioactivity. Unless, of course, you live where there's a hot spot. Now, in a cruel twist of fate, one of the hot spots in the Marcellus Shale is actually in and around the hamlet of Marcellus. And people who live there have and have their basements in the shale have real radon problems. And for those of you who didn't know, this radon is like the number two, um, considered to be the number two cause of lung cancer worldwide. Um, radon is an ongoing concern of health professionals across New York State. I was just in a meeting yesterday um, in Troy, New York, uh, uh, with um, the heads of the uh, uh, environmental uh, division of our Department of Health, and radon is actually pretty prevalent in groundwater all over the state already. So 
cracking things up and, and making radon, which is a gas, even more accessible to our groundwater, is the sort of thing that they don't they would not like to see, you know, get worse. And you know, so that's from the top levels of the, your your state organization and your Department of Health. So, uh, and that brings me to the idea of things like hydrogen sulfide and other gases. The biggest concern about hydrogen sulfide is that it's mobile. And for those of you who don't know what hydrogen sulfide is, do any of you guys have a sewer gas smell to your water? It's fairly prevalent across. And part of the reason is because hydrocarbon rich areas of the world are also pretty well enriched in bacteria that reduce everything in sight. They're called sulfate reducing bacteria because they especially like sulfate containing rocks. But they can also reduce, you know, um, iron. They can reduce uranium. It's believed that they're part. These bacteria are actually partly responsible for the enrichment of uranium in some parts of the Marcellus Shale. Um, they also love those zinc rods that are in your water heater. And so, if you get some of these bacteria in your water heater, they'll thrive there because they've got um, material that they love to, you know, subsist on. And the main point I'm making with that last idea then is that with no chemical additives at all, the flowback fluids from these wells that we're seeing developed are already you know, of some concern. They contain hazardous materials. And by the way, these flowback fluids are down there and under pressure, just like the gases. So when you drill a deep well, whether it's for stratigraphic geothermal energy, or for natural gas. No matter how you drilled that deep well, you will get fluids back. You do not need to add hydraulic fracturing fluid. These wells are under pressure, the deep zones are under pressure, and when you give them a path to the surface that's not under pressure, you get fluids back. And that fluid is hazardous material. Now, by the magic of not only the federal regulations, but New York State regulations as well, we don't call it hazardous waste. We call it general industrial waste. But it contains loads of salt, some toxic elements, and depending on where you are, it's a slightly different mix. And also gases. A little bit of radon from place to place, possibly some hydrogen sulfide, quite often carbon dioxide, which is formed in shales along with methane and methane itself. Okay? Now, the need for additives has been alluded to, and I will, I'll, I'll get to save some time on this because of how Sandra in, introduced this earlier. Shale rock contains usually some appreciable amount of clay structure. Um, Marcellus is approximately 30% clay. I say approximately again because all of these rock formations have different members, inter different interleaving, um, and, and so they're not uniform all across them. The Utica shale is a somewhat lower clay structure or clay content than shale, but the, the upshot is that if you hit clay with water, it swells. And if you drill a well with water or with a water-based drilling mud, the clay structures can actually swell and they have the actual capacity to swell shut, which would have to be really annoying if you've just drilled a well to see it kind of close up like a self-sealing tire. So they have to add things like flocculants to stabilize these clay structures and keep them from reacting to the water. Um, the archaea and the bacteria that live in these deep brines Beyond, uh, aside from being you know, anaerobic bacteria that have some tolerance for oxygen enough to live in the bottom of like your drinking well aquifer or in your hot water tank, are also very famous for forming sticky bio, you know, biofilms which can plug pores in rock. Again, if you're trying to develop a well where you're making pores, you can't have bacteria that plug them. They just get in the way. And so you've got to kill them. And so they'll throw in some biocides. Now the biocides they're using these days are different than the biocides they used to use, mostly because of the problem of scale. In the old days, you could essentially use chlorine bleach as a biocide, like anybody else shocking a well to get rid of E. coli or something from it. But in the modern technology, when you've got to sterilize several million gallons of fluids, Bleach isn't going to cut it. 
And so they're going to use different biocides that are breathtakingly more toxic because they've got more work to do. They have to work at lower concentrations or they have to add you know, a lot of this. So these biocides that we're talking about are amazing, but they do the job. Okay, and then corrosion is always a threat because, of course, we're talking about steel casing, steel drilling parts, hot brines, you know, and the hot part hadn't come in, but you realize as you get from the surface closer to the belly of the earth, it gets warmer. And at the levels we're talking about, at, at four to 8,000 feet, we're talking temperatures between 140 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit. No, it's not boiling, that's why the water's still there, but it is hot, and so you add heat and really high levels of salt, and you can imagine what it does to steel parts. And corrosion can occur on a time frame of hours rather than you know days even. So corrosion inhibitors are vastly important, not only in the hydraulic fracturing fluids, but in the drilling muds. And I don't know that it's commonly known. Virtually every additive used in a hydraulic fracturing fluid is also required in a drilling mud. The biggest difference being it's used at a higher concentration in the drilling mud. Which brings to point brings to the, the fore another current regulation in New York that just has me scratching my head. Drilling muds are considered general industrial waste also, not hazardous fluids. And drill cuttings are considered of no consequence at all and may be safely buried on site after being encapsulated in a plastic liner. And that's current New York regs and it's the, also the ongoing proposed regulations from the last time I saw them. There will be other chemical conditioners from time to time. High iron concentrations require um, some different additives. Um, high levels of hydrogen sulfide require some other chemical additives, typically amines or amides. Um, so depending on what conditions you know, operators find, they'll need to use a little bit different chemical mix to handle the, the needs of the moment. And the issue that we face is that more than 200 different chemical products have been approved for use in New York State. So I'm not talking worldwide, not the endocrine disruption exchange you know, master list. It's a little bit more focused list, but still more than three-fourths of these constitute health hazards. Not all of the health hazards you know, reflecting exposure at a high concentration. Okay, and I'm sure Tom will take on more of this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, Respiratory diseases are a little bit more typical, usually, of exposure to a higher concentrations of some of these. Endocrine diseases, by contrast, usually ha um, uh, can result arise from exposure of vanishingly small quantities. Um, infertility and birth defects have been noted not so much among people, but among livestock. And the data on these get stronger as years go by now. Kidney, heart, um, liver, and um, brain damage um, are some of the specific things, uh, as, as well as cancer, specific cancers that can arise from exposure to some of these if that exposure happens. These are some of my spec chemicals of special concern, but I, don't, I really need to leave Tom something to talk about, so let's go. This has been alluded to, and if you want to be more concerned rather than less concerned about an issue, then don't worry about, you know, the hydraulic fracturing, you know, um, producing portals or pollution pathways up from the very deep rocks, because that's a very rare event, very, very rare. It's not zero, as you, some people will tell you, but it's also not at all common. And for that matter, exposure from spills is not exactly common. Um, I've been digging into some of the specifics of the um, excellent databases, the, the spreadsheets put out by the state of Pennsylvania. What was spilled and how much, and you know, because I'm, I'm working on developing more focused and you know, uh, stronger scientific information for publication in in that area of inquiry. And one of the most commonly spilled things on a well pad site is diesel fuel. As it turns out, in case you were wondering. It's not a hydraulic fracturing additive, although sometimes they get spilled. It's really not all that terribly common. 
approximately 2% of all gas wells produced across the U.S. Have, have historically resulted in some sort of long-term water contamination or, you know, you know, lasting contamination of the neighbor's properties. Well, that's a 98% safety record. So, I mean, it, it's not like, it, you know, the sky is going to fall necessarily unless you're one of the unlucky, you know, neighbors to one of the 2% of well projects that gets out of hand. But what we have in New York State is an unsolved issue from years and years of unregulated drilling. You may be aware that the very first natural gas well ever drilled was drilled in New York State in the stream bed of Kanataway Creek outside Fredonia. They drilled in the stream bed because they saw bubbles coming up there, realized they could light them on fire and say, ha, there's gas, we can get even more. And it was a wildly successful uh, drilling operation in 1821. There was no state apparatus to handle regulation of anything like the oil and gas industry, not in 1821 and not in 1921. Records on where wells were drilled weren't begun to be kept until 1966. The DEC, as we now know, it didn't exist until um, April 20th of uh, um, 1970, Earth Day 1970, when our DEC was formed. And so it's nobody's fault exactly, but we have in this state, by the DEC's 2008 you know, annual report of the Division of Mineral Resources, approximately 57,000 abandoned wells. Approximately half of those, we don't know where they are. And in their 2009 annual report, the Division of Mineral Resources reported that the 436 new abandoned wells were discovered, while a grand total of about 240 were plugged. So we're going the wrong way with that issue. These are not tiny cracks in the ground. These are old wells. Many of them, the bottom tubing, if they weren't doing open bore drilling, uh, was never pulled up. Some of them, they pulled up the upper casing and then fixed it with a stick of dynamite. So you can't see the well from the surface because up to about 150 feet below the surface, you've got a jumble of, of broken up rock sitting over the portal that goes down to whatever it goes down to. Now, in all fairness to industry people, the majority of these abandoned wells is believed to be in the western part of the state. You know, Erie, um, you know, uh, Genesee, Ontario, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, and Allegheny counties, to Ben. Um, but there were wildcat operations done all over the state before any of this was ever recorded. And even a dry hole many of which exist in my home county of Otsego County, Delaware County, Shenango, Shemung, Broome, Tioga, you get it. Even the dry holes which were left unplugged are now portals to the deep rocks. And the kind of seismic testing that was done on the hillside over my home was 2D seismic, two-dimensional seismic testing. 3D is available, but it costs more. So the company developing a well locally to me did the 2D because they could. It's cheaper. 2D is not actually always good enough to find an abandoned well. And state law doesn't require 3D seismic testing. So we're looking at a pervasive problem that's going year to year, decade to decade, unfixed. This is one of those things that just bugs me, sorry, because it's a, it's a pathway, a lot of pathways. Erosion and fragmentation are also issues more or less kept on, you know, cupped under wraps in New York State. Um, the average well pad is going to um, generate a sediment load from just the regular rains around here with our climate, you know, and things factored in. I've done the calculations myself of about eight tons per year. This is no different than any other construction project. And in New York State, these are also typically accompanied by erosion and sedimentation controls, hay bale, silt fencing, and, all, and the like. The difficulty that we have with that, of course, is that the field agents from our Bureau of Oil and Gas Regulation have a hard time being everywhere that they need to be. As I mentioned, we have more than 13,000 active oil and gas wells going right now. We have a total of 16 field agents across the state. 
Um, so that's an average of more than 800 wells that they're riding herd on now. And, and, and so what, part of what they lean on, and I'll just put this out to you, is if you see a construction project of any kind, and I don't care if it's a shopping mall, a new road, um, a, you know, a little suburban development or a gas well that doesn't have proper sedimentation and, and erosion controls in place, you should report that because it's a, your civic duty to try to keep this siltation out of our local streams. Habitat fragmentation from uh, access roads is another issue. This is one that it, um, was talked to me, um, discussed more with me when I polled um, county health officials across the state a couple of years ago, even more than groundwater contamination issues. They were surprised at how much fragmentation occurred when you know, gas fields got going in Cayuga, Seneca, counties and things like that. Now, this is um, Northwest Pennsylvania, a photo taken in December of 2008 um, of the Allegheny National Forest on 40 acre spacing for individual vertical gas and oil wells. And industry people will tell you, well, that could never happen here because we're moving to the multi-well pad system. We're moving to, well, sorry, but the last regulations I saw that were in place have this spacing in our state code. And given potent new regulations that say you can't do that here, they could do that here. They've already done it across Allegheny, Chautauqua, you know, um, Cattaraugus and Erie counties. <clears throat> Trucks are an issue, and it brings up the idea of the diesel exhaust, which is a special concern if it mixes with volatile organic compounds to produce ground-level ozone. You've heard a lot about that. Now, there is a big move on among operators to try to recycle the flowback fluids and reduce the amount of trucking. They actually don't like bringing in 1,000 to 1,200 trucks for every horizontal well that's done. It's a pain in the neck to do that. Um, and so they're working very hard on, on recycling of the flowback fluids as much as possible until they become so salty they're unusable and have to be re diluted to a ridiculous extent. And at which point they then have to take the semi-solids and bury them in a landfill somewhere or ship them further out west where they can be injected you know, in, in underground disposal wells. Some of the options here have gotten worse because Ohio has also decided, along with Pennsylvania, to close their wastewater treatment plants to flowback fluids from hydraulic fracturing operations. Um, and so Ohio has a limited number of injection wells, and people are now having to go further west with their residual flowback fluids or semi-solid waste. Now, New York's landfills are beginning to accept some of this semi-solid waste for you know, disposal here in some of our landfills. Um, and, and I know this is becoming more and more of an issue in Broome, Shema, Shemung, um, uh, Tioga, and, um, and Steuben counties now. Um, and then, of course, there's Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law probably accounts for most of what I would call the stupid stuff, but some of this happens on an unbelievable scale. So if you have a problem with valves eroding and breaking down, pit line ears tearing, or cattle stepping into them, or your occasional, and I do mean occasional, uh, unscrupulous operator sticking his shovel through it because his um, um, uh, pit is getting too full, and if he doesn't want to pump it down, he's got to make the fluid go away somewhere because New York State requires a minimum of 18 inches of freeboard on all, all of our pits here. Liquids can get spilled, as I've mentioned, and, and people can just simply make mistakes. Some of these mistakes can happen on a colossal scale. One of the um, uh, issues that came, came up um, happened in southwestern Pennsylvania last year. Range Energy Resources was using a very, very large impoundment for fresh water. It was their intent to use a closed loop system, contain all the flow back into tanks and not allow the 
you know, flow back, you know, chemicals in the organics to rise to the surface and volatilize into the air. So their plan was to have a clean, closed loop system using the big impoundment only for fresh water. So they wouldn't have to keep a thousand fresh water tanks on site. They could put all the fresh water into a, um, this big, you know, lined pit and then draw that down for, you know, for doing their hydraulic fracturing operation. But a funny thing happened one day. The sand in the flowback fluid clogged the valves into the tanks that they were going to use for the flowback fluid. And they faced a big problem. Rising pressure in an area where there wasn't a blowout preventer, which is to say over at the tank end, not on the wellhead end. And they had to let that fluid out somewhere or face the equivalent of a blowout right beside their, you know, flowback fluid tanks. So they diverted the water away from the flowback tanks and over into the impoundment that was designed to be the freshwater impoundment, which unfortunately was less than 100 yards from about where five families lived. And those five families in that ensuing week came down with all kinds of headaches and nausea, rashes, nosebleeds, um, um, peripheral neuropathies, what's being, you know, um, a growing term down that way of downwinder syndrome from an unintentional issue, technological issue that came up. So that's what I mean by Murphy's Law. Even a small problem can make, you know, big trouble if it's handled in just the wrong way. And by the way, I got this information from a range resources spokesperson, not from some you know, so-called tree hugger environmentalists. The pit problems I've mentioned, um, this pit is in New York State. It was designed to, to collect um, flowback fluids and cuttings. We have a law in the state that says you have a minimum of 18 inches of freeboard. The existence of a regulation is not the same thing as the following of a regulation, even in New York State. I'm going to skip the biological issues now because I'm running out of time or have run out of time. So let's just leave you with my contact information here in case I've spurred questions, which I often do, I suppose. Um, and I'll let it go with that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bishop.